Acts chapter 2, and our text will be 16 to 36, although we're not going to finish this today. We're just going to do about half of it. And we've entitled this, This Was That. Peter's Sermon on, Pente on Pentecost. We're going to look at the sermon. Peter. Uh, last week we ended with Peter <clears throat> defending them, saying they were not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only about 8.15 in the morning. And now we're going to look at the positive aspect of Peter's sermon, but I'm going to read the whole chapter. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. <clears throat> and suddenly... There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speaking in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Eliamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya around Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying to one another, What meaneth this? And others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. And here's the beginning of our text, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. <clears throat> and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken. And by wicked hands I have crucified and slain. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, <coughs> and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou now wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried. And a sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before speak of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this, which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended unto the heavens, but he saith unto him, to himself, the Lord said, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, that all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in the heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent! 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. No, I'll stop there. In Acts 2, 16 to 36, we have Peter's authoritative, positive explanation of phenomena of tongues, which comes in the form of a brilliant two-part sermon. He will explain the coming of the Holy Spirit and its effect in the last days, the Messianic age, by quoting the prophet Joel. This quote is followed by a promise of salvation to those who call in the name of the Lord. And that's part of the quote. This appeal is a bridge. It leads to the second part of the sermon, which reveals that calling on the name of the Lord means believing in Christ as Lord and Messiah who died an atoning death on the cross and rose from the dead victorious over sin and death and hell. For Peter, the only way to explain the events of Pentecost fully is to describe the redemption of Christ that made Pentecost take place. <clears throat> so let us carefully examine this sermon for it reveals to us how a man full of the Holy Spirit should preach. And there are a number of things to consider. And this is especially important today when most preaching among evangelicals is goofy nonsense. First, Peter quotes Joel to establish the fact that the events of Pentecost are a fulfillment of prophecy. Now he follows the methodology of preaching that he learned from Jesus. First, he quotes scripture, in this case, prophecy. Then he shows its meaning and fulfillment and its application. And by the way, the application is within the prophecy itself. You need to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved is what you need to do in light of this judgment that's coming. He quotes from the Greek Septuagint, that's the translation by the 70 from Alexandria, around 200 BC or so. And he quotes from memory with slight changes, which better explains the text. So it's a translation of, he's using the Greek Septuagint with his little interpretations thrown in, and he's an apostle and he's inspired and he can do this. <clears throat> the statement, this was that, often translated, this is what, for example, the NIV, means that what occurred today is a direct fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. When he says this was spoken by or through the prophet, Joel, and then following the Greek Septuagint in verse 18, which adds, says God, it's not in the Hebrew, <coughs> he is teaching that the Old Testament is the very word of God. And that Joel was simply setting forth the words that he received directly from God. What Joel says is what God says. Divine inspiration. The point here is that Joel's prophecy provides scriptural proof that the events of Pentecost are God's doing and must be accepted according to their true scriptural meaning. When preaching and witnessing to practicing Jews who accepted the inspiration and authority of the Old Testament scriptures, the apostles appeal to the Old Testament for it infallibly and authoritatively proved that Jesus was the Messiah and the gospel was absolutely true. There's no better way to witness to a Jew than bring up the Old Testament. And if you go on Sermon Audio somewhere, I have a couple of sermons I did where I refute Judaism using Old Testament passages. <clears throat> 
Jews who base their religion on the Talmud, there's the Babylonian Talmud, 35 volumes in translation, instead of the Old Testament and its true inspired fulfillment and explanation in the New Testament, are in an obstinate, severe rebellion against God. Why? Because the prophecies and doctrines clearly, clearly establish the fact that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who died for the sins of his people and rose from the dead victorious and now rules over the nations. Isaiah 53. Jesus is the suffering servant. Before the coming of Christ, the Jews commonly interpreted that as referring to the Messiah. After the coming of Christ, it was applied to the Jewish people because they wanted to, they didn't want to embrace something that supported the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. Psalm 2, Psalm 110. We could go on. There's numerous prophecies that fulfill, are fulfilled perfectly in Christ. Second, Peter makes a slight change to the Septuagint version, which is interpretive. In the Hebrew text, the Masoretic text, and the Greek Septuagint, the prophecy <clears throat> simply says, afterwards. But Peter is more specific and says, it shall be in the last days. The expression last days to the first century Jew was equivalent to in the Messianic age. The last days were the Messian was the Messianic age to the Jews. Peter is more specific for he is proving that the Messiah is already revealed. <clears throat> and the events of Pentecost are proof of it. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He's been exalted to God's right hand. You must bow the knee to Christ now. Joel's prophecy does not tell us of what occurs before the Messiah comes, but of what comes after. Okay, it's not a prophecy about Babylon. It's a prophecy about the Messianic age. The implication is that the New Covenant Church and not national or ethnic Israel is the recipient of this outpouring. Okay, so already we have a proof text against classical dispensationalism, which says none of the prophecies have anything to do with the church. They all, they're all about Israel. Not so. This is about the New Covenant Church, which includes believing Israel, by the way. <clears throat> this will become clear in the book of Acts. As the Samaritans and the Gentiles receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For Peter, the Gentiles' reception of the gift of the Holy Spirit is absolute proof that they are included in the church, the body of Christ, the people of God. They are absolutely equal to believing Jews. Thus, we can say with confidence that the Hebrew, after these things in Joel, refers to the New Covenant era or the period from the resurrection of Christ to the second coming of Christ. It is with this time in view that God made his promise regarding the outpouring of the Spirit. There is simply no excuse whatsoever of these modern prophecy writers and their charlatans, your Hal Lindsey's and so forth, to apply the phrase the last days to the period immediately before the second coming. No, 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 no. The, the last days refers to the new covenant period. It begins at the resurrection of Christ. It does not refer to the right before the proceeding of the end, right before the second coming. The Bible applies it to the whole messianic era or age. The whole period of the new covenant, church. Third, <clears throat> after the time indicator is given, we are told the recipients of this gift of the Spirit. Who are the recipients? It shall come upon all flesh. The expression all flesh obviously 
does not include all humanity as in every human being without exception. It doesn't refer to those who never believe in Christ. It is defined by the narrow and broader context. The expression all flesh applies to both men and women, sons and daughters, verse 17, as well as old and young. It is truly a gift bestowed and not something earned or merited subjectively. It's a gift. Old get it, young get it, women get it, men get it. In verse 18, we are told that every male and female slave will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Not only does salvation church membership and the gift of the Spirit apply to both men and women of every nation, but it also applies to every class of society. Rich, poor, free, slave, leader, and citizen. Note that God claims them as his own by saying, my slaves, all believers without distinction of gender, age, social status, or race, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because Jesus died for the world, the whole world, the elective, every part of the world, and he saves men out of every nation. The Spirit regenerates dead hearts and gives the ability to understand and believe in the gospel. And this, beloved, is the reason that the gospel will be victorious over the nations, as Jeremiah 31, 34 says. <clears throat> A time will come, says this prophecy, that men will be enlightened by the Holy Spirit and the gospel will be so well known and so commonly believed that teaching one's neighbor about the Lord will no longer be necessary. Now, what does that sound like to you? Well, it sounds to me like post-millennialism. That's quoted by Paul, by the way, in Hebrews. Later in this book, we learn that it applies to all Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles who believe in Jesus Christ. This view is supported by the apostles and the book of Revelation. The same spirit who filled the 120 disciples on the day of Pentecost has filled countless others all over the world. People of every nation, of every tribe, of every tongue. Headhunters in South America. And when the first missionaries went to them, they were murdered by these headhunters. But then they were converted to Christ. Headhunters in South America receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Of course, they're no longer headhunters once they embrace Christ. They obey the law of God. <clears throat> now that Jesus has accomplished a perfect redemption, the Spirit is now given universally, it's worldwide, in a far greater measure. The church in the Old Testament was restricted to a tiny nation in the Middle East. But now it extends to the ends of the earth to every nation. I bet you there's Christian Eskimos. There's Christians in the tip of South America. There's Christians in Alaska. There's Christians in Canada, the United States, Mexico. Fourth, we are told about the effect of the coming of the Spirit. <coughs> These are signs that the Spirit has come. There will be prophecy, the dreaming of dreams and visions. These are all modes of receiving special revelation from God. Prophecy can refer to predictions regarding the future or simply the receiving of doctrine or teaching directly from God. It can refer to prophetic covenant lawsuit preaching where a prophet gives forth the word directly from God and then he expounds it. But here, it only refers to special direct revelations. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's applied to women. And women are clearly forbidden to teach or preach to men in both covenantal administrations. They weren't allowed to teach men in the Old Covenant. They are not allowed to teach men in the New Covenant. Women can speak privately to men about doctrinal issues. But private instruction is not the same as authoritative preaching. 
Two different things. <clears throat> Remember that Priscilla and Aquila instructed Apollo. In the book of Acts, we read about the new covenant prophet Agabus, 11.28. And the daughters of Philip the Evangelist in 21.9, they were prophetesses. They received direct revelations from God. Did they stand up in the pulpit and preach in the church? No, they did not. But they did receive direct revelations from God. So this prophecy from Joel was literally fulfilled. Literally. Now the term visions refers to another way of receiving special revelation from God. We find such examples in Daniel, Ezekiel, and the book of Revelation. And there's even Paul where he says he was taken up to the third heaven. And he says, I, he says, I don't know if I was literally taken, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know if I was literally taken up there or if it was a vision. He's all, I, I, I don't know. <clears throat> the dreams are like visions, but they occur while a person is asleep. The first generation of the church, while the, God, while the apostles were still alive and the New Testament was being written, <clears throat> this was a time when special revelation was active. It was active. And you, you learn about this in, in 1 Corinthians 13 and 14. There was the gift of knowledge, which is a special type of direct revelation. There was the gift of prophecy. There was speaking in tongues, which was a special gift, which had to be interpreted, and it was a form of prophecy in a foreign language, which then was interpreted so people could understand it. And Paul, of course, says prophecy, regular prophecy, where you don't have to have an interpreter, superior. It's, it's much easier to use and understand. But it was a time of special revelation. Prophecy is prophecy. There's no such thing as a lesser form of prophecy. Prophecy is direct revelation from God. It has the same authority as the Bible. We don't have that today. There are no prophets anymore. <clears throat> This was not simply a sign of the coming of the Holy Spirit, but was necessary due to the incomplete canon of Scripture. The New Testament was not complete. It was a period of new revelation, of explain, explaining the person and work of Christ, and thus uh, revelations were needed. Visions are recorded in the book of Acts, and interestingly, they bear directly on the missionary activity of the church. The coming of the Spirit is also a sign of the coming destruction of Israel and Jerusalem. In verses 19 to 21, we read, And I, that's Jehovah, will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now here the apostle shifts his sermon away from signs of receiving the Holy Spirit to signs of impending judgment. The prophecy of Joel foretells the doom of those who reject Christ and refuse to believe his gospel. Peter turns from the positive to the negative. And as we noted, I think last week and the week before, Paul quotes, refers to Jeremiah and he says, look, foreign tongues are a sign of impending destruction of Israel. They're a sign of the destruction to come. <clears throat> All the expressions used here are common in prophetic warnings of impending judgment. The expression, the day of the Lord, is a well-known phrase among Old Testament prophets from, for a coming period of judgment where the Lord's anger, justice, power, and glory is manifested. It is applied to the destruction of Judah by Babylon in Isaiah 2.12. It is applied to the destruction of Babylon in Isaiah 13.6 and 9. It is applied to Israel in Joel 2.1. And this, this is clearly the destruction of ba by Babylon. And also our 231, our text, which some expositors think has a double fulfillment. First Babylon and then se the second destruction by Rome. Or the destruction of the second coming. In Amos 5.18, it is applied to the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel. 
And we could multiply examples. In 2 Peter 3.10, it is applied to the second coming of Christ at the end of the age. It's the day of the Lord. And we could say it's the day of the Lord par excellence. It's the day of the Lord in capital letters. All of God's judgments in history can be seen as local days of the Lord. Except, of course, uh, the universal flood in Genesis. That was universal. And all of these point to the second coming of Christ in the final judgment. The day of the Lord in capital letters. The wonders in heaven above and the signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor of smoke, the moon turned to blood and the sun into darkness are common Old Testament apocalyptic terms for judgment by God. So we don't want to be looking at passages like this and look for UFOs and attack helicopters and nuclear explosions. That's what's not what's going on here. We interpret such passages in their Old Testament context by looking at how they're used in the Old Testament. Judgment by God is described in terms of cosmic occurrences. You'll see things like the earth, the, the universe rolled up like a scroll. The stars fall from heaven. The sun doesn't give its light. The moon is turned to blood or the moon is turned to darkness. These kind of expressions are cosmic terms for judgment to come. They're not meant to be taken literally. Although uh, the sun was completely darkened at the death of Christ, which is, which is a day of the Lord in a sense. It's a day of judgment against sin in Christ. And so the earth was completely darkened. It didn't, uh, the sun did not give its light. So there it was literally fulfilled. So you have a choice. You can, experience, you can believe in Christ and you can have him experience the day of the Lord, the day of judgment in your place. Or if you reject Christ, you will endure the day of the Lord yourself, your day of the Lord. Now the sun being turned into darkness is found in Ezekiel 32, 7 of the destruction of Egypt. It is used for the destruction of Babylon in Isaiah 13, 10. It is used in Amos 5, 18 and 20 for Israel's destruction. This kind of language is used for the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 24, 29. And I think this is referring not to the second coming, but to the destruction of Jerusalem. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And we'll discuss this in a moment, but in verse 34, Jesus says, All these things shall come to pass on this, in this generation. Those standing here, those who are still alive, will still be alive. Some of you will still be alive when these things take place. He's not talking about the second coming. Now, it applies to the second coming by application, but he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Commentators view Peter's quote here as referring to either the destruction of Israel and Jerusalem or to the judgment at Christ's second bodily coming or both. This idea of a double fulfillment. I believe it refers specifically to this audience to the destruction of Jerusalem and Israel. But it can be applied to the second coming uh, as an application. In other words, we need to believe in Christ if we want to avoid the day of the Lord that's coming. But if you were a Jew standing before Peter in, uh, this is around AD 30, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem which occurred in AD 70. The apostles were to go to the Jews first and then the Gentiles in that generation. It doesn't apply now. It's that for that generation. For Christ in his mercy allowed a generation of elect gathering in Israel before the, he destroyed the nation. This is quite clear by comparing Joel 2.32 with Matthew 24.30-31. Now here's what Joel says. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now the second half of this verse is not quoted by Peter, but it is still significant. Here's what it says. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant who the Lord shall call. 
Jerusalem will be destroyed except for the remnant, that is the elect, whom are called out by God. Now, what happened when the Romans attacked Israel? Those who believed in Christ, the Jewish church, fled to Pella. There was a break in the fighting. They all escaped to Pella. None of them died. None of the Christians were killed. The Jews stayed and were killed. The unbelievers were, were killed. The Christians were delivered. After the signs described in Matthew 24, we read in verses 30 to 31, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now, grammatically, what this means is it is the sign that makes it perfectly clear that the glorified Christ is ruling from heaven. Here's the sign that shows that Christ is in heaven. It's not a sign that appears up in the sky. It's not Jesus coming back on a white horse or floating down on a cloud. It's the sign that Jesus Christ is the king ruling in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth, and the Greek word can be translated land, the land of Israel, and they, the tribes of Israel, shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Is it a literal coming in AD 70? No. It's a coming in judgment. Verse 34, as I've said, indicates that this is a coming in judgment, not a literal bodily coming. And let me just read verses 34 and 35 quickly. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Okay, and everything I've read to you is before verse 34. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And then here's verse 31. And this is before verse 34, which says all these things that I just talked about are going to happen before all of you are dead. And he shall send his angels, or you could translate it messengers. Preachers of the gospel, by the way, are called angels in the book of Revelation, in the early part of Revelation, the angels of the churches. With a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So, the apostles are to gather the elect out of Israel before the judgment falls, the day of the Lord. Now, what all this means is that Peter is saying that the only way to escape God's judgment is to embrace Jesus as Lord and Messiah and Savior. Now, this applies clearly to the second coming of Christ, and we'll find Paul applying it to the second coming, uh, this kind of preaching warning people of the wrath to come, the second coming of Christ, when he's preaching to Gentiles. But the Pentecost sermon teaches that the coming of the Holy Spirit from heaven to the church from the ascended Christ is proof that the destruction of Israel is coming. And if I had more time to spend on this, I would talk about the trial of Jesus, where he tells them, you're going to see the Son of Man at the right hand of God the Father coming on the clouds of heaven. Because of you unjustly sentencing me to death with lies and deceit, you will see the destruction of your city, the coming of the clouds of heaven in judgment. This view is supported by the rest of Peter's sermon, where he condemns the Jewish nation for crucifying Jesus Christ. For example, verse 23, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain him. And then verse 36, God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then verse 40, save yourselves from this untoward, which simply means crooked or perverse generation. What he's doing here is he's showing them that they're guilty of a very, very great sin. They've killed the author of life, the Messiah, and they better repent, for the wrath of God is about to fall. Now, the last verse in Joel's quotation, verse 21, and it shall be that everyone who calls upon the Lord will be saved, is a bridge between the use of the prophecy in Joel to explain Pentecost and Peter's 
explanation or exposition of the gospel. Verses 22 to 36. By the way, Paul cites this exact same text in Romans 10, 13 in his discussion of salvation or redemption. The coming destruction of Israel, where millions will be cut to pieces by the Roman legions, literally killed, bled out. Now, under Hitler, six million Jews died. Three million were killed in concentration camps. Around three million were killed on the Russian front by firing squads, by death, uh, the Eisengruppen, men sent out to slaughter the Jews. Um, over two million Jews, according to Josephus, died in Jerusalem alone. And the, blood, the, the steps going up to the temple were drenched, so drenched in blood, they were completely covered in blood. And in the, in the area where Jesus preached in northern Galilee, when the Romans came through and slaughtered the citizens, they, they tried to escape <coughs> by going into the Sea of Galilee. <coughs> and historians say the blood was red. The water was red with blood. It was a slaughter. Peter's warning them. Call the name of the Lord. Be saved. This is a bridge. So this coming destruction of Israel where millions will be cut to pieces and slaughtered gives the gospel message great urgency. In rejecting and murdering the Messiah, the very author of life and salvation, the Jews were under the guilt of severe sin. And you all know that great uh, message of Christ where he talks about the, uh, the vineyard. And these wicked guys weren't doing their job in the vineyard, so the owner sent his messengers. These represent the prophets. And they beat some up and they killed others. And then he finally said, well, I'll send my, only, I'll send my son and they'll respect him. And they killed his son. And then the, the punchline, what shall be done with these men? Well, they, they need to be slaughtered. The covenant sanctions were about to fall. It is time to acknowledge your sin and flee to Christ for salvation. The word Lord in the quote from Joel is Jehovah, Yahweh. One must call upon God for mercy to be saved. And Peter will explain that this can only be done through faith in Jesus the Messiah, who died for sin and rose from the dead. Now, calling upon the name of God in the Old Testament is somewhat broad in a, in a sense here. It is to call upon God in faith, supplication, and worship. We are to establish a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and his atoning death and resurrection. Men, by their sin, wickedness, and obstinacy, place themselves under the just wrath of God. Whenever men suppress the truth and unrighteousness and they turn their eyes away from God, they suffer under God's wrath and curse and they bring calamities down upon their own head. And we could go through history. The Black Plague, World War I, World War II, the Russian Revolution, etc., etc., Stalin's debauchery. God reveals his incredible mercy, however, by sending Christ into the world to save sinners. God reveals his great wrath against sin and his judgment so that man, so that man who the Spirit enlightens will desire and seek salvation in Christ. Gospel preaching must have the law. Gospel preaching must speak about the wrath of God, God's hatred of sin, God's wrath and indignation against sin. You don't find that in churches today. Oh, don't talk about hell. Don't talk about anything negative. Just talk about receiving Jesus so you can have an abundant life. That's not how the gospel is to be preached. Preaching today is disgusting. It's unbiblical. And they've replaced biblical gospel preaching with entertainment and rock bands and skits. And, you know, these mega churches, they have little coffee centers where you can buy coffee and you can sit down and they have little TV sets for the kids. and They have playrooms for the kids. They've replaced the gospel with gimmickry and humanism and entertainment. But this is gospel preaching. You've got to talk about the wrath of God. The great treasures of God's goodness, love, mercy, and grace revealed in Christ cannot be properly understood or appreciated without understanding God's holy hatred of sin and rebellion. God has sent his only begotten son into the world to save it. 
and the Jews' widespread rejection, hatred, and violence toward Jesus has made God's wrath more hot than ever. This is not merely the rejection of a holy prophet, but God came in the flesh, God's only begotten Son, the divine human mediator. And I love what Calvin says here. He's, he's brilliant as usual. <clears throat> Quote, because men are too slow to receive Christ, they must be constrained by diverse afflictions, as it were, with whips. For as much as Christ doth call unto himself all those which are heavy, laden in labor, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, we must first be tamed by many miseries, that we may learn humility. For through great prosperity do men set up the horns of pride. For as God doth prick us forward like sluggish asses, with threatenings and terrors to seek salvation. So after that he hath brought darkness upon the face of heaven and earth, yet doth he show a means whereby salvation may shine forth before our eyes, to wit, if we shall call upon him. For we must diligently note this circumstance. If God should promise salvation simply, it were a great matter. But it is far greater when as he promiseth the same amidst manifold dungeons of death. End of quote. When we speak of salvation in Christ, this is not some, it's not like, oh, here's Santa Claus where you can have a more abundant life. Now, Christ gives you an abundant life. I don't deny that. But you're saved from something. You're saved from sin. You're saved from death. You're saved from the curse. You're saved from eternal hell fire. You're saved from torture and hell. It's not some thing for just getting a bigger car and a nicer house which is the way it's presented today. And then fifth, we come to the second part of Adam's, uh, excuse me, of Peter's sermon, which is a bold presentation of the gospel. And we're just going to start this and we'll have to continue this next week. There are a number of important elements in this, to this message. Number one, Peter's address is designed to call attention to the covenant God made with Israel. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Peter is courteous and tactful. And that these listeners were proud to identify themselves with the covenant theocratic nation. Will these Jews obey or follow what was supposed to be their duty as children of the covenant? The apostle is authoritative. These are they are commanded to listen to his words. This is important. This is not advice. These are commands. And then second, or number two, Peter identifies and authenticates Jesus as the Messiah. Verse 22, Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested by God to you with miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Our Lord was known among the Jews as Jesus, that is Joshua, Yeshua, of or from Nazareth. Yeshua from Nazareth. Thus Peter uses what was familiar or well known to the crowd. This was what he was usually called during his ministry. Matthew 26, 7, Luke 18, 37, John 18, 3 and 7. On the cross, above Jesus' head, which was soaked in blood from the crown of thorns, it said this, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. John 19, 19, and it said it in three languages. Hebrew, or Aramaic, excuse me, Aramaic, Greek, Latin. Even unbelieving Jewish scholars do not deny that Jesus of Nazareth was a real historical figure. People don't deny that. Then after identifying Jesus from Nazareth, Peter gives, goes on to note that Jesus was publicly demonstrated by God to be who he said he was through miracles, wonders, and signs. <clears throat> now remember, let's look at the historical context here. The Jewish leadership at that time, both the political leadership and the Jewish leadership, who of course were entwined, intertwined, 
was asserting that Jesus was a false prophet, a blasphemer, and a magician who did miracles through the power of Satan. That's what they taught. And that's their excuse for killing him. One of the excuses. And this, by the way, is the position of the Jewish Talmud. And it is still the position of conservative or religious Jews. Jesus was a false prophet. He was a liar. <clears throat> he didn't do miracles by the power of God. Peter says that such a position is totally wrong and demonic. God, Jehovah, did these mighty miracles through Jesus to authenticate him. Now, how did God do the miracles through him? Now, of course, Jesus was God, and sometimes his own power flowed out, as when the woman touched his garment and the power flowed from him. But generally, it was done through the Holy Spirit, who is God, the third person of the Trinity. Peter places, places the emphasis on the fact that God did these things because this proves that Jesus was sent from God and was acting on God's behalf. These amazing signs, miracles, and wonders prove that Jesus really was the Messiah. He really was the Son of God. He was, uh, the, the Messianic age has come. Everything he said was true. Everything he did proved it. And then Peter drives this point home, and in a sense, he rubs it in the faces of the Jews by adding that phrase, as you yourselves know. Peter is saying that the evidence for Jesus being the Messiah is obvious. And it is absurd to deny it. Our Lord went about preaching the truth, upholding the moral law of God, living in perfect obedience to God's law. No man had ever done that before, and as no man has ever done it since. Only Jesus did it. He obeyed the law perfectly in exhaustive detail, not only in his deeds, but in his thoughts and in his words. He helped the poor and the needy. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He restored sight to the blind. He did nothing but good, kindness, compassion. His ministry was thoroughly biblical, loving, compassionate, truthful, merciful, and contrary to corruption in all its forms, contrary to lawlessness. He opposed sin and corruption whenever he encountered it. To argue that the miracles were the result of satanic power is completely absurd, untenable, irrational, and dishonest. Peter essentially says, be honest. You most certainly know that these miracles were all authenticating acts of God. Look, give Jesus character message and behavior, given Jesus' character message and behavior, you must admit that he could not have done what he did unless God was with him. You have to admit it. You're witnesses of this. The implication here is clear. You better accept this person, his work, his message. He is the son of God. He's the son of the living God, the Messiah, the Christ. His work, he never committed sin. He came to help the poor and the have compassion on the people. He died in the cross as an atoning death for sin. He rose from the dead victorious over sin. He is who he said he was. Liberals and skeptics and atheists today simply deny the biblical account. They say, yes, there was a man from Nazareth who was a great teacher. He was a reformer. But all that stuff about the miracles and Jesus being the Son of God and rising from the dead, oh, that's all lies. That's all mythology made up after he died, long after he died. He was made up by his followers long after Jesus was dead and buried. Well, the Jews standing before Peter, who lived in Judea, could not simply presuppose that such things are not, did not really happen because they were eyewitnesses of his ministry. They saw it with their own eyes. They could deny the gospel in Christ if they desired, but their denial would be contrary to historical fact. They could deny it, but they couldn't deny it honestly. They couldn't deny it rationally. They couldn't deny it biblically. They could not deny the obvious. Our gospel is thoroughly tied to real, historical, undeniable events. 
Only those who come to the facts with unbelieving axioms or presuppositions can deny it. Liberals and atheists are simply satanic unbelievers who have an ax to grind against the truth. Don't ever listen to them. They're a bunch of liars. This is an extremely excellent message when you look at it in its details. It's amazing. It's so convicting. You know this is true. You know he did the miracles. You know he was without sin. You know that he was a man of love and compassion. You know that such a person could not be doing miracles through demons. He's exactly who he said he was, the Son of God, the Messiah. And then I'll just tell you what number three is, and we'll have to, Lord willing, continue this next week. Peter sets forth two important points about the crucifixion of Christ. Of Christ. He notes that it happened according to God's determined plan or purpose, his foreknowledge, and he notes it's due to man's acts of evil. God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. There's no contradiction for Peter. They, these go together perfectly. They're harmonious. And we'll, we'll look at this in detail next week, Lord willing. But I, I just want you to see how brilliant this preaching is. Now, <clears throat> remember once again, we have here an example of what gospel preaching is supposed to be. Now, we obviously can't do all the things that Peter did, um, for we're not speaking to an audience who witnessed the actual events of Christ. But this emphasis on sin, judgment, as a background for the need of salvation, this has to be done. There has to be an emphasis, and the Puritans were great at this. Modern preachers are not. There has to be an emphasis on the law of God and the wickedness, the sinfulness, the despicableness of sin and rebellion against God. If men don't think they need to be saved, if they don't think they need a physician, they're not going to go to a physician. They're not going to go to a savior. They need to know that. They need to be miserable in their sins and flee to Christ. Now, I hope that you understand that you're a rotten sinner. If you're not a Christian now, and you're in rebellion against God, and every sin you've ever committed from the very moment you've been born is hanging over your head and will crush you on the day of judgment, it'll all be exposed and you'll be cast in the lake of fire. You need to flee to Christ, for he did live a sinless life. He did all the miracles. He was authenticated by God. He died on the cross according to the scriptures to eliminate the penalty, the liability of punishment for sin. If you believe in him, that punishment, that hell, that curse that you deserve will be placed upon him at the cross. And then you're given eternal life because that perfect righteousness that Jesus achieved by a sinless life is imputed or reckoned to your account. So on the day of judgment, when you die, and you're dead and you're raised from the dead on the final day and you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You stand before God. God will see the perfect righteousness of Christ, the robe of righteousness. He doesn't see your sin for they're covered in the blood of Christ. That's your only hope. There is no other way to be saved. Every other system, every other religious system is satanic to the core. It falls. So believe in Christ. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful record of a sermon. The first New Covenant Gospel sermon. What a great sermon it is. For it exalts your Son, Jesus Christ, and it points us to him. Oh Lord, bend our hearts, Lord. Enlighten our minds and bend our hearts that we may love your Son and honor him and believe him with every fiber of our being and live for him the rest of our lives. For he truly is the Son of God, the Christ. O oh Lord, and help us to obey your law and to follow him faithfully. Help us, Lord, to show our love for him, our devotion to him, for he's the most important person who ever lived, and he truly is the Son of God. We pray this in Jesus.